Oh, hi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dylan T. Murphy, the most amazing young man on the planet. And sliding into view here, <laughs> is there a chair in the chair? It's me, Paul it's Murphy. It's not to be shy when I'm playing public in front of random people. <laughs> Well, you can't see them, but they can see you. <laughs> yeah. I like playing Roblox, so I'll keep like. So Dylan's maybe. in the middle of a game here. Black yeah. Town, where are Roblox, we? I guess. And while he's and doing then, that, and he's a superstar on that, I'm going to be reading to you. And yes, but I've also got some music playing right now inside of my Obby and Obby Greater. Like, so we're it's called Calamity Mod something, like Universal Collapse and blah blah blah. Yeah. So you're getting double your money's worth here. I just need to talk to the right camera because I keep getting sidetracked by the safety camera there. Hello there, main camera. And this is the book, The Amazing Smeller Man by Dylan Murphy and Paul Murphy. This is Dylan Murphy. Here's the Paul Murphy. And you can read the blurb at the bottom of this on the YouTube page to find out what the book's about. So, The Amazing Smeller Man, episode two and a bit. <laughs> a visit from the police. Prologue. Disaster strikes the putrid family when Peter thoughtlessly asks for a second helping of curry at dinner time and letting his rear guard down during the night causes half the house to collapse. Awakened by the sound of his own flatulence, Peter sees what is happening and, thinking quickly, lies on his stomach and so is able to use his powers to keep the roof aloft after the walls have fallen down. Finally help arrives. It's a miracle you have survived, exclaims Police Chief Ben Sticky through two gas masks. But poor Aunt May is rendered into a coma by the foul smell and by trying to hold her breath for three hours until the air clears. Peter watches through the window of the hospital room where Aunt May is placed so she can be hosed down before being put on the ward. <laughs> through... <laughs> I'm laughing at a book yet. I mean, this is like a new book to me because mm -hmm. I haven't read this in a long time. We're going to put Blam Neo instead of Universal Collapse right now. Like, I mean, Blam Neo is a cool song after all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I forgot where I got to now. Right. <laughs> Through cracked lips, he hears her comatose form mumbling in terror. Peter, we have to move your bed closer to the window. And... The estate when agent you, never told what? me this house was built on the remains of a haunted ancient Indian sewer. I'm leaning out of shot while I change the page. Will Aunt May pull through? <laughs> Will a donor for a nose transplant be found in time? <laughs> Will she evolve gills and join Peter in his fight against crime as his underwater sidekick? The bit after the prologue. Later, in his room, Disconsolate about his aunt, his uncle, and the lack of bread to make his toast, Peter begins to test his powers out. I must find out exactly what my bot is capable of, he muses to himself. Powerful farting cannot be my only weapon. That would soon get stale. Well, many of them are stale to start with. And with Aunt May in hospital, and Uncle Bren now well out of earshot, because he died in chapter one, uh, well, this is a good time to see just how malleable a pant painter is. If I can if I can train one to do my homework, I really am on a winner. <laughs> After several hours and two boxes of fried onion rings, our quick farting science student and novice superhero has learned to harness some of his sonic potential of his powers. Eureka! Well, they Eureka, he thinks to himself, as he spent most of the evening afraid to open his mouth. After much study, I have discovered that by tightening and relaxing certain muscles, I can emit parps, squeals and hums at devastating pitches, giving a harmonic edge to powers in addition to the most obvious one. If only I had some cabbage in the house, I could practice different keys, but I must put it on the shopping list. Now I must test out this new dimension to my power before I go into battle again. I do not want to be taken short like I was with blocked nose. That was the evil villain he fought in chapter one, folks. Before he could proceed, there was a knock at the door. Who could that be, he thought. Although he could have just gone and opened it, he would have found the answer out a lot sooner. Peter went downstairs and opened the door, and standing there was a police officer. 
Peter was taken by surprise and just managed to hold one in. Good evening, officer. Can I help you? That's very kind of you, sir. Get the lid off this, will you please? And he handed Peter a jar of pickled onions. You came here to ask me to open your pickled onion jar? Oh, no, sir. I came about another matter. But you asked if you could help me, and if you could get that lid open, it would be a big help. That's my supper in there, and I can't get the lid off for the life of me. Determined to be helpful so he could get back to training, Peter gave the lid a huge twist, but it stayed firm. It won't open, he said to the officer. I can't think why you haven't applied to be a detective with observational abilities like that, sir, said the officer, rather sarcastically. Humph, said Peter. Just wait a second, officer, whilst I uh, <clears throat> duck behind the door curtain and adjust my grip. So saying, Peter went out of view, lowered his shorts, popped the jar in place, gave a huge clencher and twisted. Off came the jar lid. Here you go, officer. Anything to help the law in their duties, he smiled. Why, thank you, sir. You must be really strong. All the boys back at the station tried, but couldn't shift it. Oh, but could shift it, smiled Peter. Uh, where is the lid, though, sir? Ah, uh, uh, excuse me a second. Peter ducked out of oh, sight again. The officer munched on a pickled onion as he heard what Peter whispering, Come on, come on. Oof. Mm. Can't believe it's stuck. Then there was a loud... Mm. I didn't do it. Then there was a loud... Sound. And Peter's relieved voice wheezed. Oh. At last. Here you are, officer, he smiled, reappearing. I'd uh, <clears throat> dropped it on the ground. Yeah. On the uh, ground? Oh, yes. You must have a very interesting carpet to make such sounds when something drops on it. Uh, yes. Anyway, officer, why is it you have come around tonight? <laughs> We've had several reports of an orchestra coming from this dwelling, sir. Trombones, mainly. No, no, that was just me. Just you? <clears throat> I mean, uh, just me playing my uh, orchestra LPs. I like a nice bit of Brahms before bedtime. I prefer Coco myself, but each to his own. If you could keep it down, sir, we would be grateful. Certainly, officer. Thank you for calling. Thank you for getting the lid off this jar. Care for a pickled onion? Oh, goodness, no. The police car pulled away and Peter went outside into the garden, having first put some very ill-fitting tracksuit trousers on. Not as good as my costume, he said to himself, with its secret rear compartment at my rear, but these should give me enough buttock leeway for what I need to do, he thought. Stealthily moving under the cover of darkness, Peter fell over the rake. Oh, by doze, he muttered, as it hit him in the, do <clears throat> in the nose. He picked the rake up and carefully moved it to the corner of the garden, which he regretted doing because he fell over the spade as he did so. Ow, my head! He muttered, rubbing it as he walked into the side of the shed, fell backwards, landed on the leaf blower, which turned on and flew him across the garden and straight into the fence. Ow, my, everything, he groaned. Doesn't Aunt May ever tidy this garden up? Cautiously, he moved to the end of the garden, mm -hmm. out of view of the neighbours' houses, more importantly, out of view of the neighbours, since houses can't see. Quietly, he set up a series of empty tin cans on top of the garden bench. Moving back 30 paces, he fell over the spade, the rake and the leaf blower again. I really should have moved them further back, he thought to himself, as he lifted himself up and backed his head on the shed windowsill. I really must get some night vision glasses in use and some bandages. I think you can gather, this is probably a visual chapter really, this one, isn't it? After checking once, once again that nobody could see him, Peter turned his back on the cans, lowered his tracksuit trousers to moon at the moon, concentrated, took aim, and fired off a G-sharp fart with diminished seventh. In a millisecond, all the cans were shot off the bench. And boy, am I glad I pronounced that word right. It works, exclaimed Peter, so pleased he had found a way to harness the latent power of farts to his will. I must try again, he said to himself. Maybe in a different key. I want it a little bit too sharp, he mused, waving the air clear. Excitedly, Peter raced up to the garden to replace the cans, getting halfway before he fell over the rake again. What are you, following me? he exclaimed, throwing it over the fence in annoyance, and worrying a bit about that me ow, that greeted its landing. Ah, <laughs> well, they've got nine lives, he thought positively, and continued towards the bench, getting three paces before he tripped over the spade. Again, I am getting fed up with this, he muttered, throwing it over the hedge, and worrying a bit about the me ow, wow, <laughs> that greeted its landing. <laughs> <laughs> Still seven left, he told himself, and managed to get to the bench without further improvement to limb to feline incident. And that's where we will end the chapter here. Tune in for the next installment of this chapter. I've been Paul Murphy.
and this has been the amazing Dylan Murphy, co-author and inspiration behind well, inspiration behind the book, and who came up with the idea, called the concept. Okay, yes. then, mate. And Dan, do you want to say good night to your fans? <laughs> good night. Good night, Dylan's fans. I give you Mr. Dylan T. Murphy. <laughs>